Well, this year's Nobel Peace Prize Award is likely to turn the eyes of the world to the millions of people who suffer from or face the threat of hunger. That's according to the committee that selects Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Here at CGTN, we've been running a series on food production in Africa. The series is in line with this year's Nobel Peace Prize theme, making food security an instrument of peace. Our episode today focuses on the impact of improved seeds. Let's get more from CGTN's Lindy Mtongana. Our special series, Food Production in Africa, continues. When it comes to farming, the seed is both the beginning and the end. But these tiny parcels of life are not created equal. Advancements in genetic engineering means that seed science is changing the way people farm all over the world. Kenya and Tunisia give us a glimpse into what seed science is all about and why it's so important to Africa's food security. If a man is only as good as his tools, then it could be said that a farmer is only as good as his seeds. And that's exactly where seed scientists come in, as the effects of climate change wreak havoc on crops and harvests across the continent, scientists are hard at work developing new seed varieties that can withstand the evolving environmental challenges of our times. I visited a maize breeding and research facility just outside Nairobi to find out more. Maize is one of the most important food crops in sub-Saharan Africa. It's consumed by 50% of the population and grown by over 300 million smallholder farmers. But maize is notoriously sensitive, easily susceptible to disease, drought and insect infestations. These challenges have worsened in recent years due to climate change. But that's where seed scientists or maize breeders like Josef Beyene come in. At this breeding facility of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, Josef and his team are working on a range of experiments that hold great promise for the future of farming in Africa. Situated in Koboko, about 150 kilometers outside Nairobi, this dry region is ideal for testing drought tolerance. Uh, we planted this uh, different kind of germplasm on June 5. And the last irrigation uh, we gave here is on uh, the la in July 24. So that's the last time any of these received water was July 24th? That's right. Okay. So from July 24 until now, there is no any supplemental irrigation or rainfall. So what you can see here, the one which is a drought tolerant, you can see is still green. Uh, the leaves are green and the cobs are full. And then the one which is susceptible is oh, completely dry. And you can see there is no yield. So the difference between these two is because of the genetics. So uh, this particular variety has a gene which can tolerate drought. So this is the one we want to give to the farmers. Another promising study is the development of a seed variety that is resistant to the fall armyworm, an infestation that has, since 2016, destroyed billions of dollars worth of maize harvests across much of Africa. Mm -hmm. So it just eats the leaves mm -hmm. and it eats the, uh, the tassel. It also eats the silk and finally it goes to uh, the ear. Uh, so this is the last stage of our testing. And now we'll just announce after we just see all the data and we will announce and some seed companies they will pick it and then a mm. farmer will, will get it. So I think we are so much excited about this. Uh, if you compare this one, the one which is out there. So you think this will be a game changer for, for farmers, for food security? when it comes to maize in Kenya? Uh, yeah, I think we can say it's just a one, one step ahead. Uh, so it's a breeding is a continuous process. Uh, so this is the first stage, the first fall armyworm tolerant. After a couple of years, we'll also want to just make another very even better than this. Mm. 
The exercise of breeding different maize varieties is meticulous, labor-intensive work, and it can take many years to produce the perfect breed. The next phase of seed science is speeding up that breeding process. So that's why breeding is always you breed for the future. If you start now, uh, the maize hybrid might be available after 10 to 15 years. So all those hybrids which is developed 10, 20 years ago will not now uh, perform under the current uh, climate situation. So that is why you have to accelerate also the breeding process. Successful varieties go from the breeding facility to seed companies who are tasked with multiplying the seeds and encouraging farmers to adopt them. We are a seed uh, producer mm -hmm. and uh, uh, marketer and uh, what we normally do is that uh, we source, breed, promote and, mark and distribute seeds across Africa. We have uh, a robust program whereby we have agronomists on the ground mm. in the field mm. who normally go to small scale farmers, even large scale farmers and train them on the seed technologies that we have. And recently, actually, because of the, uh, the activities that we do, we were ranked number one in Eastern and, and Southern Africa. For the farmer, improved seeds means improved yields. And for consumers, that means another day of enjoying one of our favorite foods. Feeding Africa's growing population in the face of climate change is a priority for this generation. But with the help of science and improved seeds, we may just be one step closer to achieving that goal. Hassan Chitui owns a farm in the Manuba region of northern Tunisia. He not only cultivates wheat and barley in the traditional way, but he's made an exceptional effort to produce two new types of seeds with great yields. Hassan's wheat seeds can produce 10 times the normal amount and are helping to guarantee food security in Tunisia. Hassan Chitui spent several hours at his laboratory this is where he keeps a unique collection of domestic seeds, including the one that has revolutionized his crop. Hassan is a self-taught man in the agricultural field. His practical experience in the land and his intimate relationship with wheat and barley made him a pioneer in the field of domestic seeds that can give the country food security. The seeds I've revived can grow in extreme conditions. The first type gives 100 years of grain. The second seed had given 194 years of grain. This is a miracle of nature. I've planted over 700 hectares, analyzed and tested over 40 different seeds in the last 25 years. The results are astonishing. Three years ago, the Ministry of Energy and Mines authorized the construction of a gigantic electric power station only one kilometer from Hassan's farm. Experts spent several weeks digging and drilling into the ground. Many fossils from the Roman era were excavated during the operation. Tons of soil were unloaded on the farmer's land. I did not touch the soil or the fossils which were thousands of years old. I just observed the land without any intervention. There was a Roman cemetery in this area. Many people were buried with seeds which were perfectly conserved. This is part of Roman funerary practices. The seeds are of Roman origin. Although Tunisia has been importing grains and varieties of seeds since the 1990s, Hassan believes in the fertility of the land and the quality of its indigenous local seeds, which can improve quality because they were used by the Romans and natives of this region thousands of years ago. The states opted for importing seeds from abroad. This strategy failed to meet the needs of farmers who are suffering from the dependency on imported seeds which do not adapt to a North African climate. Tunisia abandoned the indigenous seeds which have been used for over 3,000 years to hybrid seeds. Hassan Mansour is one of the first agronomists and landowners who have believed in the Baraka seed after being cautious at the beginning before adopting the seed of Hassan Shtiwi. I planted some seeds in my garden in the first year. I took notes and followed their development every day. The results were extraordinary, so I planted hectares in the second year, some 10 seeds in per square meter, and each seed gave me 194 years of grain. 
تفاجأت بأن العملية صحيحة. منصور advises other Tunisian farmers to rely on the Baraka seed to increase productivity. Each Baraka seed can produce some 200 to 300 grams and even more. I'm interested in planting all my land. The revolution is real. This is the future. I've never seen such a successful crop in my 40-year career. The National Gene Bank of Tunisia is an administrative institution under the authority of the Ministry of Local Affairs and Environment. The bank started its activities in 2007 with the mandate to coordinate and promote the conservation and the sustainable use of animals, plants and microorganisms. The Seed Gene Bank conserves about 40,000 accessions, including a large diversity of crop species, such as cereal crops that have been historically supple crops in North Africa. Hassan Stiwi's seeds are also conserved in these national laboratories. The Gene Bank has followed closely this year's crop of the revolutionary seed. The seeds were planted. That's when the official experiment began. 30 centimeters is the distance between each seed. I returned with other researchers one month later in January. Hassan was manually weeding. We followed the seeds until June. The Director General of the National Gene Bank of Tunisia says that experts will provide the technical assistance and agricultural guidance to any farmer who will choose to plant Hassan's Baraka seeds. I was present during harvesting in June. I counted the ears of the grain with my own hands. It weighs 6.26 grams, while the best Nisian ears of grain do not even weigh more than 3 grams. Research continues here at the gene bank, in the laboratories, and in the field to determine the origin of this grain. Meanwhile, we will assist and support Hassan and all farmers who will use his seeds. The president of the Tunisian Union of Agriculture and Fisheries asserts that agriculture is the solution to the country's economic woes, contributing up to 10% in GDP and employing over 600,000 people. This vital sector also contributes to the commercial balance, accounting for 10% of exports to the international markets. We are proud of Tunisian farmers. All the people involved in the food production chain, including researchers, deserve more financial aid and support. If we can feed millions of people, then we can limit the impact of the coronavirus crisis on the society and the economy. Hassan Shtiwi calls on the Ministry of Agriculture as well as the Tunisian Union of Agriculture and Fisheries to accompany farmers and researchers in inner regions in their quest for the production and preservation of the perfect domestic seeds. Abdan Shawishi, CGTN, Manuba, Tunisia. Today on our Expert Perspective segment, we learn more about seed science. Hello and welcome to Expert Perspective segment. My name is Nick Mudimba and today I'm joined by Professor Maria Bukuta, who is a horticultural expert and today we want to focus on seeds, a very integral part in food security in Africa. Now, do you think the quality of seeds in Africa has inhibited the continent for having quality exports? Production of the seeds is very critical and uh, training of the production uh, people who are on the value chain, on the production chain, are very important. So when we come to the export, for you to be able to export more of the vegetables or fruits or any other product, the seed you use is very important. When you talk about seed quality, we are talking about is that the variety that the market wants. If you are, going to, if you are planting a particular variety, it has to be true to type and it must be as per the description. And that is normally specified in the global standards, what we call global gap. Yes. So we find that many of our products are limited because many of them have not reached that standard. So we are limited in the quality of the seed or the varieties that we are exporting. So to answer your question, yes, the quality of seed in terms of purity of varieties and also in terms of uh, uh, the production and also the nutrition content is very important. So it does affect uh, the quantities of uh, the export we have because you export to the demand market. Mm -hmm. And if the demand market is not, you're not meeting the standards, then it reduces the acceptability of what you are exporting. 
And finally, in your opinion, what do you think Africa should do just to increase or uh, boost food production and security in the continent? We must exploit the indigenous African biodiversity. We have a lot of uh, crops uh, indigenous to Africa that have not reached the international standard. So if we can invest in it, in crop improvement, to make them to international standards, that's one thing we must do because Africa is rich in agricultural biodiversity than any other continent. Maybe second to is only by, bypassed by South America, but Africa is very rich. So we, why can't we exploit this so that we bring the international community? Number two, Africa has a high percentage in population of young people. We must entice the young people to like agriculture by introducing youth-friendly technologies. If we do that, then we are going to increase the production. Lastly, I would like to say that Africa depends a lot on rain-fed agriculture. We must exploit ways in which we can produce in an intensified way in using uh, the modern technologies uh, to efficiently use water so that we can do water harvesting technologies and use what we call control environment production not depending on, on rain if we can do three those three things i know africa is set to feed the world and now we travel to south africa where cgtn's julie shire met up with mother daughter duo Portia Mbao and lumai de smith together they're known as food of africa and authors of the Africa Cookbook, inspired by their travels all over the continent and a history of serving African cuisine in their restaurant, Portia and Lumai are passionate about African food and they spoilt us with a delicious fish recipe sprinkled with South African flair. I love Africa. I simply love, love this continent from the fact that it has a most beautiful shape to the people throughout from uh, the South Africa right up to North Africa. I love it. I've traveled to Egypt, Morocco. I love all of different parts of Africa. Hi, I'm Lumai and this is my mom. And I'm Portia. And, and we, we are the food of Africa. Africa. It's amazing to be here in Cape Town because this market, the Rangers of Market, has the best organic fresh vegetables and it's inspired us to cook something nice today. And you know whenever we come to the market we just look and see what they have, what are the fresh things they have and we make up our mind what we're going to have for supper and today we're going to do a West African fishy mojo. Now I just saw some lovely fresh egg that I bought and then the veggies were totally amazing. So I've got fresh chilies, fresh red peppers, lovely salad and now that it's spring it's such a beautiful day here today we are going to have fishy mojo for lunch <laughs> this is how they do it in africa the deliciousness of that fish inspired me to come up with this okay. fish mojo recipe so, so which is it oh this one so the fish okay. i got from the so this is like a, an, an mojo is like a what a salad a salad it's okay. a fish salad and also because I, as i said as a market so so hot and i feel for something fishy so, so we it's like a we'll seafood seafood thing right. and also because i eat a lot of fish along that senegal coast yes yeah, so. it's quite a staple of the west of it africa is, it is it is eat very fresh and light fish it is they call it chibujin but um but yours is in emoja for our south african trip so i've got my hake already flaked and then there are my shrimps. These are the main ingredients of the fish emoji. So now the salad. Okay, so that's what I'm chopping for. I'm so chopping all the fresh stuff. Okay, so it's parsley, so you bell need parsley, peppers, bell peppers, garlic. Garlic. And, and then that's it, and spring onion. Where's your spring onion? Spring onion. Spring onion. Good. All right, so, so that's what's going in my okay. salad. Portia, this book mm. here, it has everything on Africa. All from my trips on Africa, yes. Must be it's, so. It's a it's a journey, an adventure. Yes, yeah. So there's inspiration from all the countries that we've travelled mm -hmm. to as a family over many many years, um, and it's it's not directly like the food that you might find there, but inspired by what they grow there. You know the the sort of flavours and stuff that we found there. So it's it's inspired by Africa. South African flair is interesting because it's kind of a melting pot because sort of, we are so many from 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 the Cape Malay to the Indians in Durban from um, 
the different cultures and also because we are a melting pot from the British that come here, that came the Afrikaners and also the indigenous people, the Khoisan people and different African. So it's kind of a mix. So I kind of just take my, I kind of let my tongue do the flavoring. So when I bring my South African flavor to a lot of the African dishes, it's with the spice and the herbs. So yeah. what I can tell by just what you've done here mm -hmm. is the, this um, combination of, of scents, of smell. and yes. This not only the color, mm -hmm. but just the smell is incredible. How fresh! Yeah, it is. All my dishes and all my take, whenever I interpret a dish, I try. There's always a freshness to it, and I, for me, the color is important and also the flavors. Because I'm not a person that cooks with a lot of stock cubes or tin stuff. Everything has to. I, I must make sure the flavor comes from the actual ingredients. And it also is a, an affordable dish. I mean, it's very affordable because you can use any fish and you can have any bread that you want to. It's delicious. Good. Ladies, Good. Yes. thank you so Cheers. much. You're welcome. For allowing me to come to your kitchen. It's been lovely having you with us. It's been yeah. very lovely thank having you. you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Join us again tomorrow for the final installment of the Food Production in Africa series as we explore exports.